time pressures at the far end. Call this joint committee meeting of the DPW and the City Council to order. It is being done today for the public. It's not on live, but it will be on public access at a later date. If there is, we tend to run this meeting more informally. If any, if there's any public comment now that people would like to make, that's fine. If you'd like to chime in later when we come to a specific topic, that's fine. So, is there any public comment now that people would like to make? And you're welcome to also make it. Okay, seeing none. The agenda is on here, so um, I'll entertain a motion to approve our minutes from our April 14th meeting. And will we approve those minutes? Motion to approve in a second. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And so the first uh, agenda item is a discussion of the tree canopy and tree warden, and I invited Lily Lombard to come here and do a presentation. Some of us have seen this at the City Council meeting a few weeks ago, but I think it would be important for all of us to see this. Um, so Lily, I'll let you just take it away. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, I don't think I've ever met you. Are you a member of the public? Or? Board of Public Works. Mike Parsons. Yes, maybe we could introduce uh, ourselves. I see, I see names, so sure. I'm, we're fine. I know David, okay. he's a neighbor. Terry's a very close neighbor. I know the rest of you. So without further ado, thanks for having me. Uh, I <laughs> Go ahead. just wanted to start by saying that um, as a citizen of Northampton for 12 years now, I have become increasingly appreciative of the role of public works in our society, in our city, and the budgetary squeeze you all have been under for far too long and have had to cope with. So all of this conversation is in the backdrop of that reality and with appreciation for the work you all do. All right, so a society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they know they shall never sit. This is a photograph um, taken just before the tree on the right, which was um, planted by Jonathan Edwards, uh, in 1758, years before he died, and survived until 1913. Uh, this it culminates about a year of research that I've done, including interviews, travel to cities afar and close by, and uh, online research literature on the subject of trees and what it means to have a, a, an intelligent and comprehensive City Tree Program. I've used a lot of different resources, all the way from um, U.S. Forest Service down to talking to uh, Northampton City Planner, as far away as um, City of Toronto, where I interviewed their urban forester and a director of one of their uh, citizen tree programs. And then, um, very specifically, um, numbers of people in Amherst, the DPW director, the tree warden, their public shade tree committee chair. Uh, so my, really to just get to the crux of it, I'm here today because I believe Northampton needs a comprehensive tree program. Uh, this is a dichotomy of Northampton Bridge Street in the 19th century and then uh, just a few days ago. Uh, and these trees uh, died from attrition, uh, development, and uh, Dutch elm disease. So a whole bunch of reasons, but now it's sort of lost from the public memory and people think that this is the norm when actually that was the norm not so long ago. Uh, the benefits of trees are many and we can just shout out a few of them. Um, Terry, you're on the tree for committee for a little while. What do you feel like are some of the benefits of trees to this city? Oh. <coughs> Sorry, I'm making this an interview. <laughs> You can cheat well, with my little cues here if you want. <laughs> well, I, I think that the shade is uh, welcome in the summer. Um, especially the large trees that uh, have the stature to, to look what we consider typically to be a shade tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how, what about you, David? Some benefits of trees? I think trees look a lot better than dead open space, which might be another name for streets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so trees, trees provide shade and cool. They also do a lot of great public works. They uh, buffer wind. They take up storm water. Uh, they uh, improve our air quality. Um, and then they do all of these other things that have been well documented by peer-reviewed 
um, researchers, they uh, increase our property value, they spur economic activity in business areas, they improve our mental health, they increase our use of, of public space, uh, they buffer noise. So, I mean, the, the, the benefits of trees are, are so huge. And what I'm here to say is that with climate change, these benefits are even more compelling. When we talk about climate change, we talk about mitigation and adaptation. Hi, MJ. And uh, on the mitigation side of things, so that means trying to uh, limit the uh, degree of global warming. And street trees, urban street trees, do this better per tree than any tree out there. And they do that because not only are trees the best stores of um, carbon of all of our plant material, woody plants uh, store 21 times more carbon than non-woody plants, and then, of course, mature trees, like these on Hospital Hill, uh, trees of 30-inch diameter sequester a thousand times more carbon than trees of 4-inch diameter. So they're really the captains of carbon storage. And then when you put that on a cityscape, you have the ad added benefit that they directly reduce the energy demand in the city. Um, and that is, again, really well documented. Uh, in the city of Worcester, recently, they had to take down 28,000 trees because of the Asian longhorn beetle infestation. And they documented the change in energy use from before and after. And what they found was in, in neighborhoods where there was total tree loss, there was a 40% increase in energy usage in the summertime. So it's massive. Um, I live on Monroe Street where we used to have uh, mature sugar maples all up and down. And in the last 10 years, the whole streetscape has changed dramatically. And the folks that are on the southern side, that are, that are facing south, have had to shift to air conditioning where they never had them. And I had my neighbors say, this is what happened. It was apropos. Like, I didn't come saying, can you give me the benefits of tree trees? She said, I came into her pool. I said, oh, it feels great in here. She said, yeah. When, the, when we lost that m mature maple in our front yard, we had to switch to air conditioning. So it's, a, it's, it's really a very um, immediate cause and effect. And then there's the adaptation, so how we cope with the fact that global warming is coming, whether or not we like it. And that is, you know, for the, pu the Public Works Department, that is all about stormwater. Um, and here, here's, here's what we're looking at. This is our future. Actually, this is our present, and our future is going to be more of this. So this just came out from the National Climate Assessment in April, this map which shows the Northeast region is experiencing a 71% increase in very heavy precipitation events. So we're getting hit the hardest with this. And this is what trees do. Trees buffer our wind, trees um, s slow the velocity of water, and they also take in water from their, their leaves and their roots, and they, s and they mitigate the storm water that, that floods into our our system. And uh, this, the U.S. Forest Service uh, says that for every 5% that we increase our canopy, we reduce our stormwater runoff by 2%. All right. There's another issue that is front and center for the folks who live in the valley. We right now experience a grade F in air quality. I don't know what comes below an F in air <laughs> Um But we're looking at F minus in the future because ozone formation is heat dependent. And this is again where trees come in. Large shade trees reduce local temperature and remove the most pollution. And I just want to quote from the Sustainable Northampton plan where they, they would put these little sidebars of little factoids and one of the things they said is trees planted along travel ways can reduce vehicle emissions by removing sulfuric dioxide and reducing particulates by up to 75%. So air quality is, um, is going down with global warming, and trees are a great way of buffering that. Well, we can ask you questions as you go along, or do you want to hold I think we should hold it. I think we should hold it, yeah. Okay. All right, so to conclude, not to conclude, to <laughs> summarize this little piece, Trees are a long-term appreciating infrastructure. In fact, they're only public works infrastructure that appreciate over time. This was the Parsons Elm Tree on a Con Street, corner of Cons and Old South, in the early 20th century. And today, it's a still a beautiful, healthy tree. It's, it's at least 200 years old. Its canopy is even providing more shade than it had before. And if you look at the stretch of the canopy provides and, and the amount of rain it's going to catch before it hits the ground. It's really quite, it's really quite um, awesome.
So what does an intelligent and comprehensive new symmetry program look like? I spent a lot of time asking a lot of people this question. And here's the five points that I came away with. It installs a professional tree warden. It performs a baseline tree inventory. You have to know what you have in order to know where your gaps are, where you need to grow, where's the most intelligent place to put trees, where your vulnerable areas are. It develops a plan. Uh, and well, the city is very good at creating plans. We you know, speak with a lot of different departments, get buy-in, get public input, and then we are guided by an overall vision. It leverages resources. There are grants out there that other communities are taking advantage of that are offered by the state and the federal government for re reforesting their cityscape. And we could be holding our hand out there and getting those resources too, and we're not. Um, it also leverages citizen volunteers in a big sort of way, and uh, students. And I, I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to Amherst. And it is supported by a healthy budget. Once a, um, a city comes together and realizes this is a priority, then they allocate resources for it. I'm certainly not here today saying to you, I want you to do more on the same budget. I'm saying, I'm, I'm taking this education show on the road to create the public will to increase a budget to have a comprehensive tree program. This is the city of Toronto. They, I, I visited them last summer. They have a world-class tree program. This is an example of a succession program. They are, they, they are out in front of trees that are aging out, and they are planting new ones ready to take their place. All right, so this is Northampton's tree program over the past 10 years, and I will just preface this by saying this is not finger pointing. This is not about blaming. It's, um, it's about learning from past mistakes. Uh, so the, the state of Massachusetts requires every municipality to have a tree warden, and of cities with 10,000, population 10,000 or greater, it requires a professional tree warden, someone who's got expertise. So in a state of desperation, because Northampton had many years no tree warden, citizens came together and pushed an ordinance through that created a citizen tree committee to act as that tree warden. And uh, I think that they, they worked with the greatest intention, and they, and they certainly worked very hard and diligently, but I think it was a very frustrating experience. And this was from lots of interviews I had with many of them. And, and the, the result of it was I think they were, and, and this, is, this is boiled down. This is not like, I'm sure there's lots of them nuances here, but I think that they were able to improve some zoning requirements in the city, and so when new development happens or when there's a permitting process, there are new trees that go in. But they were not able to achieve a tree inventory or a tree management plan. There were, especially in the last few years, a um, great deal of frustration and attrition that happened on the committee because they felt like they had no budget and no authority. Um, and the city experienced an overall tree canopy decline, and you can see that in this chart that I have. It came from directly from stats from the DPW. I just put it together on a spreadsheet. Uh, I, I, they had year by year, and I put it together as a longitudinal view. And so you can see that we lose an average of about 31 trees a year, and, uh, and that's happened consistently every year. We have always been in the negative. And unfortunately, the, the model of tree planting and care in the city is a reactive one, whereby uh, the trees are removed when the public, members of the public say that there's a tree that's threatening my house. Uh, and they're planted not, not according to a plan, but more a one-for-one one sometimes in the same neighborhood. Um, it's, not, it's not guided by an overall inventory or a plan. And currently, um, I'm sad to say, there is no uh, existing tree community. This is an example, this photograph is an example of a poorly placed tree on my street, Monroe Street. So this is the side of the street where there are no utility interferences, and it's the south facing side of the street. So it's getting massive full sun. And so it's logical to plant a shade tree there. The, the tree belt's wide enough to support one, and instead the city um, put in a red bud. That has ab about stayed that size for five. Uh, this is just a quick reference to what the Sustainable Northampton Plan says about trees. It really is very, there are a lot of generalized uh, goals in this plan, but not a lot of brass tacks uh, recommendations, except for that we should strive for 25 new plantings a year. All right, Town of Amherst, a model to emulate in my um, uh, 
assessment. And this is after interviewing lots of people, including tree warden Alan Snow, who was named the state's top tree warden. And uh, after they bonded $612,000 to plant 2,000 trees. Uh, this is, uh, you know, if you don't want to take my word for it, you can uh, take the word of Ma UMass's Extension Service uh, head, Rick Parker, and he wrote an article on how you, uh, Amherst is a model for Massachusetts communities. All right, how did they get there? They were, um, this, is a, this is a point of encouragement for us, is that they were <laughs> in as bad a state as we are about seven years ago. And they dug their way out of it, and now they're in a really great place. So they had decades of tree neglect and canopy decline. They had no tree warden. Uh, through grassroots lobbying, citizens were able to uh, encourage the, the city to take on a volunteer tree warden, and they, they initiated a, a tree inventory. And then when there was a switch in the town manager, there really was a whole new opportunity to reach someone at the top and the DPW director, and they, they suddenly, sort of the light switch went on and they bought in. And so they, they found a way to create a full-time position for what was then their volunteer tree warden, and he was really the best person for the job, so that, that's a good thing. Uh, and they called him director of trees and grounds, so he says he spends about two-thirds of his time doing tree work and about a third doing other ground maintenance, park cemeteries, things like that, common. Uh, with, with Alan, they were able to write a grant to complete a tree inventory, and then the city uh, decided that it was willing to bond to plant these 2,000 trees. That's what they're in the midst of right now. All right, so what does that bode for us? I think it's a really um, encouraging model that we can follow. And these would be my recommended steps for immediate steps for Northampton. The first is we have no current tree warden, or so we're not abiding, abiding by... Mass General Law 41, which requires every municipality to have a tree warden. So my first recommendation would be, be we install a volunteer tree warden, one who is qualified, to serve as interim uh, while we really figure out what we want to do here. The next is that we conduct an iTree survey. So iTree is a free online software that um, was created by the U.S. Forest Service, peer review, that allows people to uh, use their smartphones to inventory trees and then quantify the benefits of those trees. That's the beauty, is that it really helps put a dollar figure on the value of those trees. But it also helps you pick all this other valuable information up. And I would say that citizens right now are, are taking the initiative to uh, make that survey happen. We were trained in April by Molly Feilisher, who is in the lower left corner. She's uh, the state's community forester on how to use iTree. And uh, we are now putting together the specs for our city, and we're gathering 40-some volunteers to do an IT inventory. And I, um, I said this, I said this at the Nest meeting, and I'll repeat it. Uh, we would very much invite and welcome input by the DPW on on the inventory. And you know, if, if there's an arborist uh, on staff to have that person be part of it, I think it's going to be a really exciting uh, event. And then uh, consider, I think, take, take a little time to consider how to fit a permanent tree warden position within the DPW. The uh, Amherst did it by creating a new position. I, I don't know the ins and outs of the DPW. I wouldn't even begin to make a recommendation in that way. But I would say that it, I think it's imperative that this be a permanent position. Whether or not it's a full-time position, I can't really say, but that it be a permanent, ongoing position is very important. We've seen a lot of what happens when there's a little, when there's breaks and fits and spurts and it just doesn't lead to forward movement. Um, the Department of Conservation Re Resources offers seed grants for hiring a professional tree work up to $30,000. So I would recommend that you uh, apply for that and if, if anyone needs uh, support in writing the grant, I do that as a living. I write a lot of grants, and I would be happy to offer my services. The grant is due this cycle in November. I think you need to put in a, an intent to apply in October. And then continue to build public and elected will to fund a comprehensive tree program. That's what I'm doing. That's, you know, I know that I've, um, I've excited numbers of city councilors. Bill Dwight and I are going to be publishing an op-ed piece in the Gazette, co-authored about this subject in a couple of weeks. Um, 
And so I'll end with this. Trees are the only public infrastructure that appreciates in value over time, and that value will be utterly evident in 20 years with rising temperatures and tempests. With that future in mind, the Chinese proverb has never been truer. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time. Northampton Five Star Sustainable Community would be wise to invest in a comprehensive tree program. And that is another view of Bridge Street in the 19th century. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. First comments in Jane, you had a question. Uh, the question I had was around the um, the region again of the F and the air quality, um, the air quality standards. I, I thought that was largely driven by the uh, coal plant plant emissions out in the. Uh, you mean the air quality in the valley? Well, it has to do with the fact that we're in the valley. That's mm -hmm. the big one. And that no, it has to do also with the fact that we get prevailing winds drive pollution from even much farther away from our immediate re region. Into right, Arizona. up in the metro New York and the, uh, yeah. the coal burning plants out in Ohio. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So the, I mean, I think the tree canopy is clearly a, a, an issue that can help mitigate. Yes. But it's not locally based smog that's being generated. No. Uh, that's being driven from. That, that was my point. Right. No. I mean, whether or not it is, it's here, yeah. and we have to deal with it. Other questions, comments, statements from anyone from public? I have two quick questions. Yeah. Hi, Lily. I'm Britt, sure. by the way. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. First off, I know that the, since the big October snowstorm a couple of years ago, the utilities have been much more aggressively yeah. cutting down trees. Yeah. Is there any way to get the figures from the utilities to add them to your presentation, uh, see how many trees we've lost that way? Because personally, neighbors that have first dropped first would be a question. Tree. I don't know if Jim, if you would know this, but when the utility cuts down or does anything with the city tree or MJ, you might know this. Um, do they contact the city, and how does that work? And do they get permission when they're touching city trees? I think so. But this is true. These are trees that are not officially city trees, but are just but maybe a little bit trees. further back from the sidewalk. I, I know two different neighbors who've cut down trees because because of this policy. I'm sure there are many mm -hmm. more. So I assume, Lily, can I just so I assume mm -hmm. your your fingers there. Those are city trees. We don't know. Yes. The I'm referring to city trees. Right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, sure. there are a whole the whole. I'm sure stands of trees that are going to when their uh, development is put in, or or when you know a uh, there's a redo of like a parking lot and old trees are taken down. But this is just what the city's records on public trees that they're planting and taking. Sure, of course. I, just, I just thought it might it might further enhance your argument. Well, my, my other question for you is, uh, do you have any figures about? Um, the tree mitigation of, of storm damage. I mean, how much could the city actually save by having more trees? That's where its eye tree comes in very early. Because it does help to quantify those sorts of things. Uh, very, very specifically. Like, it'll give you a dollar value of storm, va storm water mitigation or things like that. So I don't have those off the top of my head, but very smart people have, have um, contributed to the creation of this software that does that for us. There's no, you wouldn't have a sort of, you know, Potent possible. You know, no, not I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even. Well, you, you did have the. the, the <laughs> yeah, you need, you need to start with an inventory to, to know like what you've lost. We well, you did have the two percent savings on five percent increase in trees. Well, that's of runoff. Stormwater. Yeah. Right, stormwater, isn't that? But what, what, just to get back to the issue of, of tree of uh, utility lines. So one of the things that Amherst does is they they, they have a they have a the tree warden has a relationship with the arborist. Of, for them, it's Western Mass Electric. And whenever he comes to town to, to do work, they're in contact with each other. And when there is concern whether or not they're adhering to um, prop best practices with trimming, Alan will go down and just be on site. In Northampton, National Grid is in contact with Richard Parcelli and the Highway Department and lets us know what work they're going to be going on in the city. So mm -hmm. I think that same type of communication happens with Rich, although he's not technically the tree warden here in Northampton. I think part of this is I mean, Rich is stretched pretty thin, and so I could imagine it's tough for him to be able to go out and look at big branches that are cut off of city trees, and as you, I think even the way you just language that, he's contacted about the work they're going to do. And I think that's probably true, rather than he consults because he's able to have the time and energy to go out there. And I, I think one of the reasons uh, I was glad Lily was coming is that I think we really need to look at the recommendation that you're basically saying here, which is we need somebody who does this. We need a tree board who's working in the DPW, I believe. And um, because I think 
and, and I think we need to get the money for you guys to do that because you've been stretched so thin over the years with the resources. But I think this is an important priority. In support of what you're just saying, Paul, in my neighborhood, uh, it seemed to be true both that the utilities come in and sort of preemptively lop off big chunks of trees that look like they maybe come, come down in some storm in the future, which I think a tree warden might have an opinion about. I mean, I'm not sure that, the, you know, it's in the utilities' interest, I assume, to be very aggressive about preventing fu future power outages, but, but it isn't necessarily good for our green infrastructure. I'm also concerned that people in my neighborhood who've become concerned about the health of city trees bordering their property are apparently able to just request that trees get taken down. And I, I don't know at this point who reviews that request for its, you know, for it, whether or not it's a reasonable request. You know, and I, I, I don't, I don't want homeowners, uh, even even ones who may have consulted with a you know, a tree removal company or something for their recommendations um, to just be able to ask that a mature tree, which is a kind of a community resource, a neighborhood resource, be taken down on their say-so. And in one instance anyway, a neighbor of mine wanted to take down a very beautiful mature tree, believing it to be rotten and unhealthy, and uh, I persuaded her to let a second arborist come in to give an opinion, I hired that second arborist who said and persuaded her that the tree was not unhealthy. But, you know, if I hadn't taken that fairly extraordinary step, it would have come down and it would have really been a sad day. Um, I also just want to reaffirm that in my neighborhood, which is still full of mature trees, it's, it's easily 10 degrees cooler on a summer day. When I go downtown, it's like, ugh. I've gotten into another climate zone. It's, a, it's like night and day. I don't have central AC, and I have big trees around my house. It's very cool and comfortable. Um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you. I think that it's remarkable that you've taken this on. Um, I think that as a city, we're really lucky to have someone like Lily who is kind of spearheading this, shepherding this process. Um, so right there, we already have kind of a, a, a leg up in this process. I do think we need to hire a tree warden, warden, but in the meantime, we have the citizen committee that's willing to do the inventory. Well, what we would do is a sampling inventory. So it's a 5% inventory that will give us, it's a scientific sample. So it will give us a, a very good representation of what our overall tree canopy looks like on, on residential or downtown right-of-ways. And uh, so it allows you to extrapolate and then come up with some quantities, so it quantifies the benefits of, those, of that inventory uh, un, uh, according to various measures. So it's not a complete inventory, and, but there is money, there's grant money for complete inventories. We just need a tree, a, so that's one of the things a tree warden does. He just, he's always pulling out all of these opportunities for free money that, that are out there. Well, this is kind of the direction I was going, is just to, to look at all of the resources that we have um, before we get to the point where we have in the budget enough money to hire a tree warden, and to, to really kind of, um, if we can inventory the resources that we have, first of all, whether it be you know at the local level or at the state level in terms of grants that we can apply for. Um, we have the Stockbridge School at UMass. I don't know if you talked about that before I came in, but they're an incredible resource, and they will give us volunteers, I think, for tree planting and all kinds of other things. So I just think that there's so much already on the ground that's available to us, it's just a matter of kind of resourcing it and, and using it. So um, I think what would be a useful step is, and I know that you've already done a good deal of this, Lily, is to um, kind of maybe help us with some kind of guidebook about what is already available and what can, what we can do in the here and now that will lead us on that path to ultimately establishing a, a position for a tree warden. I, I hear you, and I, I, I think we do what you're saying. I also feel we've looked at this before with some great people who are very excited about doing a tree committee. I had a lot of energy to do that. And I've really, I, I personally have just reached the place where I think we need somebody who is a professional, who takes charge of this. We have those resources. What I see, what we might serve as a committee, which is that one place where we overlap with DPW and the 
the city council is that we use whatever influence we can use as elected officials, come to you and say, how do we get this done as soon as possible? Because we've watched for a number of years, and I've, it, it is hard, I've seen over and over, when it's using just resources at all, volunteer resources, you can do a lot, but we really need somebody who's a professional. Paul, let me be clear, I was not saying that we're putting off <laughs> doing right. exactly that, I was saying that I hear you. I'm current with that process, Great. I think there's a lot we can do, and I think that it, it shows um, our commitment when we apply for grants, the grants that will get us the money to actually hire a tree warden and all kinds of things like that. So I'm just saying we're doing a parallel process to clearly going in the direction of hiring someone to do this. Just like to say a few words. My name is Jim Gerard. I was on the tree committee with Terry and a few other people here. And I'm also a professional arborist, and uh, I also work for the city as an arborist, as a tree warden for a period of time, temporary tree warden. And I think it's much more effective to have one person to do that job. One person who's trained to do it can make decisions quicker. The whole process can run a lot more smoothly and a lot quicker than it's actually it's not functioning right now because don't seem to have a quorum to, to meet at the meetings and get any work done. So, And I think the people on the committee now would appreciate having somebody working for the city who is doing that for them. I think it would be a much more effective process. I, I know I've already spoke, but I can speak to the fact that it's not working. I'm, I'm the co-chair of the Social Justice Committee at the Unitarian Society, and our youth group tried to get in touch with the tree committee just to plant a couple trees this year, and nobody ever got back to them, so they finally gave up. So I, I got in touch with Lily out of that, hoping she could maybe help us find, and she said, there is no quorum. So even citizens who want to volunteer by the tree and plant it and just need a little bit of guidance have no way to do that right now. And I think the town of Amos has a tree committee that assists the tree warden at this point, and I think that's that's the hierarchy that should exist to make it work. Yeah, they do. They, uh, they run some great events. I mean, the, the tree committee is not burdened with having to carry out what's called Mass General Law 87, which is, you know, you referred to it, uh, Sarah, when, when the city is required, if there's a healthy tree, or, or if there's a, yeah, a healthy tree that wants to be taken down, it requires a public <laughs> hearing. And right now, that, it has been take, that has been the job of the tree committee. And it's burdensome. It's not, it's not the fun part. Citizens should really be called upon to do the galvanizing citizen for planting and watering and ongoing care, but not the, um, you know, the having to make decisions about whether a tree should be removed. And especially when that's their only job, which is really kind of what it started getting down to. I think for people in this room, they may not be, and I'm not totally involved, actually I'm not involved in this at all, right? But there was a tree committee that did a lot of these responsibilities of the tree board until fairly recently, is my understanding. The board members may not even be aware of this. I have heard, but not involved again, that the tree committee is basically non-functional at this point. Mm -hmm. I believe that, may, that uh, Ned, the director, has been talking to the mayor about what possible direction to move in terms of replacing the tree committee with the tree board, you know, whatever the whatever the solution is to sort of get this type of um, activity back up and running. I don't know the status of those discussions other than I know that there's obviously something dysfunctional here that people are very concerned about. I think the goal is one that everyone can get behind and it's a matter of determining the best way to move ahead. And I think Ned has been talking to the mayor about it. You may know more about it than I do really in terms of discussion with counselors and that sort of thing. But, uh, I have a meeting with the mayor tomorrow to talk about where, what's happening in terms of this, this session and right. others. So I, I, what I would suggest is that we, once I speak with the mayor and that Ned is here at the next meeting, I'd like to make sure we continue this, not that we have to shut off the, today, but that this is going to be a discussion we do have to figure out what role might this committee play um, in that. Is this some way we pass, you know, we want to just endorse this idea? Do we want to do something more active or less active? But I think once we should find out from Ned and the mayor where they are, and um, even asking them what they might need from us to 
move this along. I'm sure it's the, the goal, I'm sure, is something that we both agree with. And the question is how do we enter in this and get it happening as quickly as possible? Paul? Well, yeah. <coughs> it seems to me realistically the FY16 budget, well, they'll start building that January, February. Yeah. So if we wanted a position, the DPW, I mean, it, it has to be a little bit of a dance. Yeah. It ha there has to be some intention at the mayoral level and city council level to fund it. Yeah. And then I'm sure you would, would in turn turn to us and say, could you define it? Could you put a budget to it? What is, what is it that you would be asking us to approve? Yeah. But there's enough time between now and it's, we've got seven months before the budget process starts over again for next fiscal year? I think there are resource issues too in addition to just the salary of a tree ward and how sure. that would do, whether it's it part time. There has to be that dance where we flesh out what would it yeah. take and you indicate some uh, willingness to to receive this uh, as a concept. Like, right. like Amherst actually had, you know, it was a real political thing. They decided to put a bonded issue. Before. Yeah, that I mean, was. We may need to look at this in that kind of way. Where's the public support? Is this something? <coughs> and to clarify, that was very specifically for tree planters. Yeah. That was actually to pay for the trees. Three hundred dollars per tree, two thousand trees, six hundred thousand dollars. But that, that includes the planting of the tree and the watering. Well, the it, it, it includes the cost of, of putting those trees in and, and all of that's wrapped right. into it. The but it doesn't. It doesn't include. Doesn't include no, it includes the cost of the trees. It, I'm it, just saying that, that it, it includes more than just the cost of the trees. Yeah. But it does include things like yeah. equipment, hiring more people for it. So, so there's to run a tree program. I think it's going to take more than just you know single bonding. I think that is like okay, let's catch up for the last 20 years. But I don't think that that is you know. I know it doesn't because I've spoken with Alan about it. Um, that, that, that does not comprise their whole budget. And so I would invite you, because they were a great resource to me, to have a conversation with the tree warden over there and the head of the DPW, and they, they're happy to just share what their budget is for all these Yeah, I mean, these are, they're not like excessively complicated things to figure out, I don't think. And I think Terry makes a good point that figuring out what the budget would need to be and how it needs to be worked out. The only point I was going to make a minute ago is that the city has had money in the budget in recent times to purchase trees to have them planted. And the failing in part that I've seen is the lack of staff time capable to plant the stock that was in the budget to buy. So that it's more than just saying we need 10 grand to buy X number of trees. It's finding the labor within the department that can plant the trees and take care of them. So it's, you know, there's, there's Can I speak to that a bit? It, it, I'm not sure exactly what happens at Amherst, but they buy trees at a very, very reasonable cost. And then in the summer, they're able to get people to come and be interns and volunteer to do it, to pl actually plant the trees as opposed to using DPW staff to some extent, not that DPW is not involved. I have, have a volunteer organization that plants trees in Northampton. And we plant some trees. But my, my biggest... And when I started planting, I thought if we could just plant the trees, we would solve part of the problem. But the longer I'm here and the more I understand about the trees, the more I understand that not having a tree warden available to coordinate efforts and direct them is wasting resources all the time. Um, there, there are, as you said, a lot of resources, but um, a lot of them are just being wasted. I mean. Great. There's a there's a ordin ordinance or a, a a rule that you have to plant trees down on King Street when they remodel, the when they renovate. But those trees are often improperly planted. The tree committee is. I've gone to the tree committee and spoke to them about it. They can't go and enforce that. Whereas a, a tree warden can just walk down there and tell people they planted the trees incorrectly and change that. That's hundreds of trees, thousands of dollars of resources being squandered and that's just like I see that all the time and it's just it's very hard to 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 feel good about what's happening without a conductor and there are all these resources I, I'm one of them I mean we I through volunteers committed a lot of resources and, and money for buying trees that's not really going anywhere so I, I think the, 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 there are tree warden and there's money and even if we just had a tree warden who was just a volunteer who just put in 10 hours a week or five 
to start conducting this, I would feel much better. With uh, I would feel that, that, that there were less less waste and, and a little bit of direction um, in the whole process. And that's how Amherst did start. They had a volunteer part time, and I think that would make a huge. I'm not arguing that there should be a volunteer tree warden. That's not not going to not going to work. But it would be a way of getting started in the next months because uh, there are all there's all this energy, Lily and everybody else. But if we could we could move forward if we had a, a conductor, so to speak. You know, I've, I've brought up these grants before. I think that um, there's a, a state grant called the Community Innovation Challenge Grant, which um, one of its only, it's one of the easiest state grants to get, and one of its only requirements is that there's some interdepartmental um, coordination on a project. And I was thinking, you know, between planning and sustainability and DPW, and it addresses stormwater, which is one of their focus areas for this three-year cycle, um, that could be a really good project to apply for. And I don't know if that would come necessarily from, you know, the DPW or um, the planning office as a sustainability project, but I think that, that would be a really good idea to look into that, and I think those are also due in October, if I'm not mistaken. So now would be the time to be looking into that. I'm not sure who wants to kind of spearhead that, but that's one way to look for some money. I wonder if just a suggestion would move forward, perhaps if just the two of you could have a conversation about that. I'm not saying to do anything and have, get a little more information and you write grants, I'm not saying you would have to do this, but we could maybe outside this committee kind of talk about who might do that um, if after you guys take a look and see if it's even reasonable. Maybe there's somebody on the BPW who does grant writing. We do write grants. I know you do, and I know you're swamped with it, so I'll try to kind of see. Maybe that's one area yeah, you I mean might I've use certainly, some of these I've resources. certainly offered my services. I want to be as efficient with them as possible, so. I mean, I think that our lowest hanging fruit is getting that captain at the helm. And then once you've got him or her, then I think that it's so much easier to move forward. So that would be my recommendation is let's first install a tree warden. And then let's look at all that we can do. We're going to go ahead with this citizen uh, tree inventory. And, and if anything, it's going to raise a tremendous amount of a public awareness, I think, and excitement about what, what it means, what, how trees are valued. But um, I do think that we should keep our eyes on, on, on the singular prize right now, and that is getting a tree warden in the DPW. Right. Hey, yes, yeah, a couple yeah. more comments, and then we need to move on with the agenda only because we have a bunch of other things to that. Yeah. My name is Deb Jacobs, and I was, on the, um, I was part of the group that um, helped get the um, tree committee going, and then I was on the tree committee until I was term limited. But one of the things that impressed me in one of the towns I looked at was Lexington. And one of the things that their tree committee, um, they, they have, I think, three main um, functions. One of them is to um, look for grants and to help uh, raise money for um, uh, trees. They update the inventory and they um, do a lot of educational um, Pieces. They actually have a, a book that they um, that they that they've written, um, and I think that you know these are some of the things that you need a tree warden to have, and and you need the the working together. But I think there are a lot of models that are very successful. I have one last quick question. I'm sorry. We haven't talked about what the penalties are for being in violation of state law. <laughs> Being publicly shamed might be one of them, but I mean, is there a chance that Northampton will actually, you know, lose some grants or lose some state money as a result of not obeying state law? I, I, I wish that were the case, but I don't. Yeah, think I don't think so. But I, that's a good point. I can bring it up with the mayor tomorrow, and you know, there's the carrot and the stick and all these things, and maybe, you know, sometimes it's the way you have to go. Lily, thank you very, very much. Thank you for having um, me. Nice meeting you all. I just want to say one thing. Lily's just, this has been great, and uh, you certainly lit a fire under me, thank because you. it certainly has been an issue in my ward, 
and I've called people and done stuff. There's so many other things working on. It's like, okay, I call. And I realized nobody's, as you said, there's nobody really at fault. We're all trying to do our best with this. But I realized it took your energy to light a little bit of fire under me. And one of the things that concerns me, we've talked about this, is I really want to keep this alive now because, as you've talked about, this can kind of this energy that's there can die uh, rather easily. Of after a time, we see no action. The people just start to get discouraged. So I want to make sure we keep moving forward. And um, well, good thing you partnered with a highly obsessive compulsive person. Yeah, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So, so you you'll some, come back. Yes, yeah, I will come back. <laughs> We'll, we'll talk at the end about whether we have a July meeting or not, given this meeting, and that we often take one of those months off. But the next meeting, this will be on the agenda. And I, and I would hope Ned would also be here, because he will have input, too, about it. And thank you all for coming. And you're welcome to stay for the rest of the time. That's something that I put on the agenda. I want to an update. Um, and I know that the fire department had a lot to do with it, but my understanding was that the DPW was looking into it and wanted to hear what was found out and where it's going and if it will happen again and all that kind of stuff. I don't know any other questions. Okay. We're going to have to talk about the next one. Okay, so let's continue. Anyone that would have been involved with our operational people on what happened? Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll continue that. Maybe in the meantime, you may want to just call that just so you kind of know. Let's put it on emphasis on top of it. Post winter pothole spilling. That was also my item, and I just wanted a kind of update. I know that uh, there are still places that are struggling. I know that. Uh, what meeting was it at that we. Oh, with the budget meeting, the budget hearing, we got kind of update. So in the meantime I've gotten that update before I put it on the, after I put it on the agenda, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that we need to know about in terms of you know completing uh, repairs for two thousand the winter of two thousand fourteen and, and Richie, so forth. For us to let you the highway superintendent tells me that for the most part we are done with winter pothole filling and we're moving into Item number four in the new business, which, which is pavement projects, where we're trying to take the worst offenders that we've been catching the potholes and um, putting the pavement down on those or otherwise repairing them in a more permanent way. Um, so some of the worst offenders that we have, the streets in the city, show up on this year's paving list um, for the new pavement. And we posted, did we post that, right? Okay. We are to post it was posted. It was posted. Yeah. So a quick question that I have is, if we know that there are still areas outstanding that are not on the list of pavement projects that have real holes, we can still be reporting them and have them patched? That's still going to happen? Uh, may I ask a question sure. on the subject? Yeah. So, one thing that I've noticed um, it, it seems that when gas companies especially but electric other utilities have to dig that they then pave over the holes themselves. Is that true? That is true. A very significant proportion of the potholes form in those areas. Is there any way to require them to use uh, regular standard as opposed to substandard pavement and techniques to do that? They're, they're costing us huge amounts of money because the potholes form there first. Yeah, they're, re they're required by the trench permit process that the city has to patch the cuts that they make in the street to the standards that we set. Terry, your body language is speaking volumes. Could you uh, articulate <laughs> a little more? We are struggling to come up with a policy about that. Uh, it's been a, a long time coming, but it may be coming closer to fruition. Is that true? Mm -hmm. the, the issue is, can we arrange to inspect the end product? And when should the inspection happen? Should it occur within the first six months, or would it be better to wait a year or two and see how things are working out? But without an inspection process, it, it strikes me that we're somewhat at the mercy of whatever was done, hopefully was done well. But we, we know, we know in many cases it wasn't done well enough. 
So naively, if it would only be an inspection process, is that what this well, is? So on? My understanding is that anyone who takes out a trench permit, makes a cut, repaves it, is responsible for the, the patch for the first five years. And in fact, they could be required to come back and improve upon their initial work if, it, if that initial work turns out to be somewhat deficient. How, how often have we asked to do that? Is that is it Bay State Gas occasionally has just been outrageously um, deficient. The and problem is that inspections aren't systematic, as Terry has indicated. Inspections are probably close to non-existent. So what happens when there are worse, the worst cases where holes develop or the trench patching is simply so egregious that people call to complain, or Terry calls, then we get in touch with the contractor, whether it's the gas company or whoever, and require that they go out and repair the patch. So it sounds like this is an issue you've been talking about. It is. So mm -hmm. And that you're working on and understanding. <coughs> because it would seem, yeah. sort of from the outside, like, God, I mean, yes, it probably takes somebody's time, which is always money, on the DPW to go out and inspect this, but the amount of money it's probably costing us is considerably oh, greater. A, a poorly done patch is offloading. The contractor saves money, and the city is what winds up with the bill. The, the $250 uh, cost of a trench permit, on the other hand, may not be enough to um, cover the cost of inspections. But then the other way to look at it is after a five-year period, for example, for that, because that's like how much are we spending, the city spending, to repair what somebody else did and damaged mm -hmm. would probably be way beyond the cost of somebody inspecting. So I would just encourage you to look at that way as well. I agree, the trench permit probably won't cover it, but, but I think it's a good point. What, are we, you know, what is this costing us? And is there, do, do we have, we may not have a systematic way of looking at the inspection right now, but do we have any idea how often we've had to go on, go on out and make the repairs? Because that would then make the case to say, this is what it's cost us in the last year or two years or five years. Are um, permit fees comparable to other cities around here? I mean, is there a way to kind of leverage more money that way if we can get more repairs, or is that not kind of the right approach? I've, I've been... <coughs> My approach would be to make the permit fees <coughs> defensible. It's $250. It's $250 because it's $20 worth of staff time. It's uh, someone has to go out and do the initial inspection, and you just work mm -hmm. through what happens in the, through the entire cycle of a particular event and put a dollar amount on that. So that but it seems like they have to be within a realm of and well, and, and we're, we're getting some pushback, even at 250 oh. So From who? From people who have to take out the trench permit. Do you know if they feel comparable it's to other cities in the area? I don't. But, but my, my, my point is, my, my thrust has been to make, to be able to easily explain where that number comes from and, and, and be able to do that irrespectively of what East Hampton charges. We don't charge 250 because East Hampton, East Hampton charges 250. We would charge 250 because of these are the expenses that are incurred through the entire process of that trench permit. I think at that point people say, "Oh, all right, I guess that makes sense." They're justifiable, and I think they're on the high side of area communities, if I recall. Yeah. There's an underlying thing here, and that is we need champions to take ownership of each of these, whether it's trees or patches, and the people that are candidates to be champions have full plates. And, and so I think that's our struggle. We, yeah. we, we know what to do to make it work. We've just got to find a champion that can devote enough time to be mean and ugly and scare the contractors and, and succeed in getting them to come back. The, the difference here is I would love to have somebody look at how much is this costing us. Oh, each year that we're not having something. That's different than the tree warden where you... Oh, know, over the years, it may be millions. I agree. So therefore, I mean, maybe somebody really, really mean and ugly is going to be a million-dollar person a year, but most people are not. And I, I think this is one where we kind of look at this and say, what, what are we doing here? It kind of seems irrational not to be looking at this and say, wait a minute, 
we cannot continue to allow this to happen any longer. And financially, it's wise to do this. It's not an extra budget cost, although initially it might look like it. We're going to make money back on this. And none of us would do this in our own personal lives, this kind of thing, and lose all of this money. We just wouldn't do it. You, you can't help, though, run into the issue. These would be Richie's guys, right, who would do this? Or also the same guys who would be the tree workers? Or also the same guys who are working up at the end of State Street because of the flooding up there? Are, is this, these are the same people? Is that right? There are 11 guys who are also patching the potholes and sweeping the streets. I mean, it's this, it's this little... Jerry, I understand that. It's the guys that actually do the work. Jerry, one small stretch of street that's dug up by Bay State Gas one block, my street, Massasoit, that is done poorly, and then we have to redo it as a city, <coughs> that's going to go a long ways to paying somebody's salary for almost the whole year. I mean, you know that. We would so need support like, for that. I mean, we, well, it seems to me the case could be made we'll pretty ask. easily, and that it should be asked and presented in yeah. a way okay. that it seems pretty a pretty easy financial case to make to me. Maybe it's not, but... There, there's a way that you could uh, accomplish that without a tree warden style advocate, and that is just change the policy. If you take out a trench permit, you are responsible for compensating the city for doing the work for it when you're done. Period. There's no inspections, <coughs> there's no staff other than the staff required to do that, and the city doesn't lose a dime, ever. It's an interesting idea. It could be really difficult. Um, the contractors doing the cuts are making the cut, for example, in the case of a gas company, because they're going in to tap into the gas gas line. Well, they're doing it somewhat random times. The coordination alone, I think. It, it would be a nightmare. Do they coordinate with the police department? Not usually. Not on the neighborhood streets now, they just go in and do it. And are, are most of these, if we took the, uh, the numbers of these, are most of these two or three different, most of these either Bay State or other large folks doing this, do they, are they handling 80% of these and the other 20 are they? I mean, there's a, there's a wide variety. I mean, in the last few years, you know, the gas company has been ripping up the whole city, but there are a number of Contractors, large and small, across the city that are that are doing utility work. So you know, it's a pretty yeah. large number. But we know who they are. Everyone gets a permit. Everyone I signs the uh, the five-year obligation. I thought you meant if we had to go back at three years. I said this is this job was you know we didn't inspect it, but we don't we don't inspect it. But we've gone back after three years. And we've got to redo this thing. Look at this. Send them the bill. I thought that's what you meant. That too. Well, all right, so, so let's just say we're working on it. You're working on it. And if you would like a report in a couple of months that or something. That would be great. Yeah, about in September? Yeah. That'd be so great. if you so put on the uh, September agenda. Okay. Okay. Not mean or ugly enough, but it sounds like a <laughs> point. <laughs> okay. Uh, pesticide reduction in North Carolina. That's mine too. Um, and I think I'd like to table this. I do have a, just a brief update, and I'll um, let you know what I'm doing with that um, and table it until I have a little bit more information. But um, I'm meeting with the mayor later this week to talk about the um, possible formation by executive order of a pesticide reduction task force in the city um, that would look over time at alternatives to pesticide, maybe um, integrated pest management, leading eventually to some, at least some organic management um, beyond foreign fields, which he's already uh, made a decision about. Um, and what I'm hoping for, I've been working with the Board of Health on this a little bit, and they um, initially were thinking about spearheading this and um, hoping to kind of lead some kind of task force, inter, some kind of inter departmental thing. Um, they've kind of backed off of that because I think they had quite a reaction to um, some attacks around uh, what they did with the smoking ordinances. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to check in, I guess, with this group now um, and 
the BPW, um, you know, if that might be a place where you'd like to be in terms of chairing this, if in fact it's pulled together, it would be, I think, a mixed citizen, um, multi-department kind of task force that would be tasked with initially doing kind of investigation, um, looking at what other cities in Massachusetts have done, that kind of thing. It could sit here, it could sit in the Planning and Sustainability Department for department sure. Health. Well, the Department of Health, this is what I was saying, is that they've kind of backed off wanting to have that, take that leadership oh. role. So I was just putting out, I'm putting out feelers at this point, and I'm going to talk to the mayor later this week, and I'll come back to our next meeting maybe with some more information about it. But anyway, just to plant that little bee in your bonnet to see if um, there's interest <coughs> and if it feels like this is the right place for it to sit. Oh. Is, it, is it driven somewhat by water quality improvement? Um, I, I don't think that we've defined you know, what is driven by. I mean, my, my initial vision has been health, and mm -hmm. that's why I started working with the Board of Health on it. Um, but I think that it can, we can cut it from any which way. I think the Sustainability Office is a real candidate, too. I think the BCW, because it does a lot of management of you know, that's why it could sit here. So it's definitely an interdepartmental kind of issue. Yeah, it's just um, when you use that pesticide, and I also think about the nitrogen loading of what people do with fertilizers and how that affects the uh, water quality. Our stormwater runoff. Yeah, yeah, stormwater runoff is a big piece of the need for a reduction. I just have to say that if they want to back off taking leadership on pesticide reduction, because Bill and Lee and I didn't question some of their Board of Health regulations, that's really unfortunate. Because we have questions on some of our regulations. Scared up to on one issue, so we're not going to take part in something that's totally I, different. I, just, I need to say, Jesse, that that's more my surmising oh, than anything. Okay. Because You're probably right. It, kind of happened, <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. happened after that <coughs> that they kind of came back to me and were a little bit more hesitant. So this, that's kind of my... Um, Interpretation of what happens, don't take it as gospel by any means, but that's exactly what happened. Okay. Boeing at the community garden, that's actually mine. I had a couple of calls from, and this is new because this uh, area is new to my ward just this term. Mm -hmm. So folks have been calling me and saying that around the community gardens, I guess a number of years ago, the neighbors were actually doing some mowing who lived near there. And they were doing that mowing recently and were told by folks from the DPW to stop that. But their concern is that nobody's going up and doing the mowing, and so they would like to be able to continue to do that. And um, I didn't know where else to bring it, and I just thought I'd bring it here to say, well, what do we do in situations like that? So they're mowing around the edges? I think they're mowing in this, the place between where like their homes are toward the end and the other side oh, okay. and the gardens. And it's more a general question. I think I could have phrased it differently. It's like, what if citizens do things? Like, you know, the DPW is, can't get around like because of budget stuff. And somebody just wants to go over and plant some flowers along because they've done it for years. And the DPW, you know what? You really can't plant the flowers there. And I understand both sides of this. So I kind of just wanted to, one, go back to them and say, what's our policy? Do we have policy on that? What would it be? Are there exemptions to that? Should they and say, look, could somebody come over and take a look, and here's how what we'll do. I just... <laughs> the city engineer reports that it's news to me. <laughs> but I'd be happy to look in there. Okay. That's first of all. Great. Um, that mixture of first person and not first person. My super size ego. I will have to, I'll have somebody call you. I'll talk to Ned about it. But yeah. if somebody wants to look into the specifics. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sidewalk conditions and ordinance pertaining to obstructions. Council Adam. Okay. And Mr. Robbins. Um. I always had a conversation with Jasper about about um, sidewalk obstruction because um, I don't want to speak for you, but in, but in his Jasper's opinion, there are a lot of obstructed sidewalks in the city, and um, 
sometimes they're not removed, the, the obstructions are cleared very quickly. So what I, in, in his opinion, and, and that well, might be true, or ever. So what I did was, I, I was just curious about how, how it worked, what the, what the process is. So I took a look at the ordinance, and um, what it says is that no person, no person shall allow an obstruction to a sidewalk or to the edge of road pavement or shoulder where a sidewalk does not exist including any obstruction in the form of a tree, bush, or other vegetation which, proce which protrudes over said sidewalk or edge of a road, pavement, or shoulder. Where the Board of Public Works deems it an obstruction to a sidewalk or to the edge of a road, pavement, or shoulder exists, it shall give notice by registered mail to the owner of the property causing the obstruction to, uh, causing the obstruction to remove or prune said obstruction within 14 days so as not to block, obstruct, or overhang the sidewalk or edge of the road, pavement, or shoulder. If the property owner fails to remove or prune the obstruction within the said 14 days, the Department of Public Works, or in the case of, of trees, bushes, or shrubs, the tree warden, shall remove or prune the obstruction at the owner's expense. So, <coughs> when I looked at that, um, what struck me was that um, the BPW defines itself what an obstruction is. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing in here that really um, describes what that is specifically. And so, it, it, from reading it to me, it seems like people aren't really on notice of what constitutes an obstruction because the BPW determines what it is and then um, enforces it. So, what, what I wanted to ask the BPW was, um, well, how does it define an obstruction? Um, how often are people asked to remove obstructions? How often do we have to, does the city have to remove obstructions at the expense of the owner and um, and maybe this this needs more needs to be more clear the ordinance which if it does I'd be willing to work on that. Do you have examples of the uh, obstructions? I have a huge amount of data that I've collected but I wanted um, to let Jesse finish with the legal aspect of it first. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then I was going to get to the the, the, legal aspect. the only point I'd like to make is that I think that it's potentially challengeable because void for vagueness. I mean, it really says the BPW will decide what an obstruction is and then will enforce it. And I just don't really think that citizens are on notice of what that is. Um, that's why I wanted to know, you know, um, I mean, basically it enforces it after determining unilaterally what that is. So I, I just want, I wanted to know um, where obstructions have been determined. I guess practically speaking, other than the legal aspects that we're discussing, I, I'd be curious to know from that or whatever, does that ordinance work today? And I, uh, again, I don't get involved in this sort of thing where people complain to Ned about a sidewalk being obstructed. I do know that about a month ago I had a, a conversation with Ned with Council of Barge about an obstruction in her ward and a notice was sent out in accordance with the ordinance. I don't even know what happened there because Ned was involved in it. But but I'd be curious to hear from him about whether the ordinance as it's drafted functions appropriately as it is, or is there some problem? And if you have a list of a thousand sidewalk obstructions, you might want to share that. Yeah, it's approximately that many. With, you might want to um, share it with with us to, to look at. Or I, I don't really know the, trying to understand the scope of the problem. Can so you print it? something you can uh, print Yeah, I, I, have, I have something um, printed, and also I'm going to sit in the Lily Lombard and something else. If I can find the screen briefly, um, which is just a supporting argument. Uh, but so let me get my folder. Is this the sidewalk or streets as well? Um, as the, it, the name of the, the, the ordinance is obstruction of sidewalks, and um, but it says to an obstruction to a sidewalk or to the edge of road pavement or shoulder where a sidewalk does not exist. So. So um, the document that I prepared, I didn't have enough ink in my printer to print multiple copies, but I'll read uh, the, the part that is just text. Um, over the last six weeks or so, I've surveyed, I'm not exactly sure what percentage, but basically from exit 19 to uh, Earl Street and then up to parts of Florence and the entire Prospect Elm Street neighborhood. Uh, pretty much all the sidewalks in that part of the city. Um, and I, tr I tried to get my methodology to be as scientific as I could without 
purchasing any tools or, or having any scientific training. Um, so my definition of obstruction for the purposes of this survey was any stationary object that diminishes the width of a paved public sidewalk. So in other words, someone having a dog laying on the sidewalk, that's not stationary, that's going to move. Um, but actually, if you'll remember, when I started this project, I called the Department of Public Works um, to get their definition of obstruction. And I was told that the way that they define it in the context of that ordinance was it, a sidewalk is considered obstructed if the people using it have to walk in the street. In other words, if there's a tree belt or a grass belt or what I like to call a median, and people are using that, even if the sidewalk is 100% obstructed, it still doesn't count as an obstruction according to the DPW, which, if that's true, is silly, honestly. So um, what, what did you come up with? So. I divided obstructions into three categories, minor obstructions, which is less than a quarter of the, of the total width. And I, I was doing percentages because uh, it just has, it has to do with, it, it makes more sense than inches, I thought. Um, sidewalks in Northampton range from 18 to 60 inches with the exception of Main Street downtown. Significant obstruction is 25 to 74%, and then a complete obstruction is anything over 75%. And I was doing it, you know, with an eyeball estimate, but I took pretty good care sure. to, spread, you know. Um, I excluded anything resulting, uh, any obstruction coming from a tree that looked like it was planted by the city, and those are on both sides of the sidewalk in certain neighborhoods. And I also excluded, excluded any temporary obstruction, such as a child's bite or a large pile of weeds that, you know, some, anything that I thought would be there for less than 24 hours. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot on here that explains how I did it. And then uh, a, a list of what I think are errors in the methodology because it's not completely scientific. Um, and I came up with, in, in the area, I, I surveyed, I think, over 90% of the sidewalks in the area. And I have a map that shows it. Uh, not 100%. And I came up with 415 minor obstructions, 270 significant obstructions, and 47 complete obstructions for a total of 732 obstructions in the surveyed area. And then I have I have the list of all Jennifer, 732. Yes. Doesn't the ordinance have something about um, grandfathering in tree trunks and things like that? So that even though it's a permanent obstruction, as it were, it's something that's not no. going to be movable. And but you, you didn't count those. Correct. I didn't. I didn't count them. And I and the reason I didn't count them is because any tree that's that close to the sidewalk there's a very high chance that it's a city tree, and so it wouldn't be the property owner's responsibility anyway. So, so in general, what, are, what causes the obstructions? People, uh, so, I think all but one of the ones that I listed mm. are vegetation related. And so what causes them is property owners either intentionally, so property owners that abut the sidewalk, either intentionally or accidentally, and I've seen many examples that I think could be in either category. Mm. Um, declining to keep their gardens in check. And I consider hedges to be gardens because they are mm -hmm. done for, mm -hmm. in okay. part, aesthetic yeah, reasons. I get it. Um, this time of year, uh, although it goes on for most of the summer, a lot of them especially in the 25 to 50 percent range, are um, lilies, where people plant large amounts of lilies alongside. And so they're only, you know, up to 18 inches high, but they block most of the sidewalk because they grow quickly. And since they're intended to be symmetrical, people don't want to trim them. But they, they shouldn't be planting them that close if they're going to take up half the sidewalk with, mm -hmm. you know, with their flowers. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the really serious ones seem to be neglect as opposed to I'm going to do it and I don't really care if people can't use the sidewalk. Again, are you talking about vegetation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I only saw one where a chain link fence, one or two where a chain okay. link fence was coming into it. And I think that's very dangerous, but that's not. Yeah. Well, that's very helpful to know if yeah. that's the major. I mm -hmm. thought there would be more of the chain link fence. Some people building their buildings and parking their cars permanently. Or I s uh, well, there were, there were two that were basketball hoops that have been placed permanently across, completely across the sidewalk. 
one of them was on a, a small side street, one of them was on what whatever the street's called that's at the back of the um, the child care center on Vernon Street. So Forbes, I think, Forbes. had one of those as well. Or Ward, I I'm wondering if this would be um, something, just a way to simplify it instead of like starting to deal with measurements and defining exactly, you know, how many inches from here, how many inches from there, if this could be something that could fit within the Commission on Disabilities and and we could say as long as it's passable to a wheelchair of a certain, that that would be the way to kind of define it or maybe rewrite the ordinance? No, because the, if, if we are going to spend city dollars on you know, a con street, a specific decision was made, we're going to buy 60 inches of sidewalk. Why should the public only get to use 24? That doesn't make any sense to me. I, I kind of agree with where you're going, but, but you know, it, we need, what I'm saying is we need some, we need some clear definition. <coughs> uh, maybe something along those lines. I don't I dis maybe disagree with Jasper a little bit there, possibly. But but we do need some clear definition of, of, of what what an obstruction is. Rather than we know when we see it, we'll do it then. We just kind of that. That's a time honored solution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in well, Amherst, 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 let me just say sometimes it, it works. I mean, for example, I know the basketball coach across the five bucks. So sometimes it works that if nobody cares that it's obstructed because it is a small street and you can walk around it and the kids are playing there and no one really has ever said, because it is a tiny area, or actually Ward Avenue, there's the same thing happening. And I think uh, over on Dryad's Green, there may be a similar thing. Or people who, <coughs> you know what, I like the lilies a lot and we it's a, it's a street that very few people pass so you never have traffic two ways. I would agree if a wheelchair couldn't has nowhere they can go, that's one thing. But people might prefer, because I certainly don't want to chair the public meeting on this, lilies versus passage, because you could have a little battle. But I think some of this is like what makes common sense as well. So I, I agree with you, man, need to tighten up the ordinance. But some of this is like who's using that particular sidewalk where? And that every single case where it's being obstructed may not be causing hardship or harm. I, no, I think we have to this. think about kind of maximal versus efficient. You know, I understand right. that point. Like, if the sidewalk is 60 inches, does that mean that every you know you have to have access mm -hmm. to every 60 inches? Versus, you know, who's going to be using this? Two people abreast and a, a wheelchair. I mean, that to me is what is important. Is you know that it's passable. I I don't know if I would want to legislate something around. You know, you have to be able to go. The whole width of whatever was built, or something. Amherst like that. has done that. Um, Amherst is really surpassing us really today. Really, they're just flying there. Every, every which way. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amherst has done that. The only other <laughs> town where I was able to get a response from the officials was Longmeadow, and Longmeadow has something uh, a little bit clearer but similar to ours, which is um, you don't obstruct it, but we're not going to say what that is. Um, but to your point, I agree. Actually, I completely agree with that, and I think that enforcement should only be if it's complained about. I don't mm -hmm. think that there should be someone monitoring it, because if no one cares, I don't care. Yeah. And if I cared, I would report. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess my big question is, the I think the overarching question in this conversation is, what's the goal? I mean, why, are we do why would we legislate this? And I think that can help us come up with the answer of how we need to legislate it. Well, the goal, as I said earlier, is that people, the public should know what constitutes an obstruction. Um, this ordinance, as written, um, says where the Board of Public Works deems an obstruction to a sidewalk is, et cetera. Then they See, that's legalistic. I'm, I'm looking at a bigger question of what's the goal of knowing what's obstruction and what isn't. Mm -hmm. you know, is it because we want people to be able to walk? Is it because we want wheelchairs to, you know, people with disabilities to be able to move through our spaces? And if that's the case, then we need to create ordinance that that allows that to happen. Yeah, we, well, the goal is beyond. maximum realistic usage. Correct, and that's clearly defined. I think. Generally speaking, people are less likely to feel uh, encouraged to use spaces that are narrow and or confining. Um, and CVS has actually spent huge amounts of money on renovating a very large number of their stores because they had feedback from their customers that their aisles were too narrow. That's and a whole different ball of wax. That's 
kind of commercial, how you create store spaces, I think we can't compare that to something like that. If I'm we want thinking more of the Middle East, them. where I grew up, the lanes are so narrow you can hardly fit in them, and people walk everywhere. You know, it's it's more about a culture. I don't think that I, I just think we're kind of creating science out of nowhere right now in this discussion. I, I mean, I don't I don't disagree with you completely, but I just think that we have to be careful how we're um, making our points. You know. I think if you're talking about CES and how stores design the aisles so that people want to be there to shop, is very different than encouraging people to walk. I think they're all different um, reasons why people choose to walk or don't walk, and it has to do with our culture in, in all kinds of ways, not just about the width of a sidewalk. Sorry. Uh, first, just as a little historical tidbit, <coughs> um, Sam Brindles, the director of the Department of Public Works back in the 90s, late 80s, 90s, uh, used to allow no vegetation other than grass, mowed grass, in the space between sidewalks and the curb. And um, there was a particularly pretty meteor, what do you call that strip? Uh, there's a particularly pretty tree belt, belt on South Street, and he sent them a cease and desist letter. And Mary Ford, the mayor at the time, publicly just ridiculed him for such sending such an idiotic it letter. Really nice it was it's beautiful. So, so at that point, we stepped back. Uh, she, she just made him look like uh, horses behind uh, in public in the newspaper. Um, but did prior to that, minute take or get yeah. that <laughs> but prior to that, <laughs> nothing was allowed in that sex that uh, tree belt. Um, I guess my question is, what is it that you would like from us, from this group, today? Uh, well, well, I, I would like to know. Um, I would like to know when, when, um, when the board has tr traditionally defined uh, how it's defined obstruction, and I'd like to know um, if I can have some examples, and if there have been situations where people have been asked to clear up an obstruction at their own expense, or that the board public expense should be passed on to them, what those were. Um, I actually, they actually, based on a call from a, a guy who lived on the corner of Bridge and Elizabeth, I called the, BP, the DPW and asked them to um, look into whether or not there's obstruction there. For example, mm -hmm. I never, I never heard back. But, um, but also, I'd like to know, I'd like to know from, from, um, to try to gauge from how how frequently it's been, this has been enforced. If there, if there, if there, what kind of an issue? If any, there is with the sidewalk obstruction. Um, it's never come as, to the as board. The, as the DPW defines yeah, it's it. It's never come to the board. Mm -hmm. But we, I yeah. guess we have to ask Ned. Yeah, because, I mean, the, this says the, the DPW, that doesn't happen. It, it doesn't come to the board. So it's actually the department of leadership. Just, just anecdotally, I think two or three times since I've been a counselor, I've called. And things have been done. And, you know, people have complained. It's not been one of those major things that have been around a while, I think two or three. Mm -hmm. And then something is done. And I... I guess it, it has not been an issue that I've heard a lot about. When there's been a complaint, I have found that it's been dealt with in a kind of logical way. And this is one of those that I, it's, it's almost like the noise ordinance that we debated for quite a while. And basically the police department said, we're not going to enforce this because we enforce it when it seems logical to enforce it. And even though if you have the noise ordinance, we're overwhelmed. And, and I guess just keeping it more on this, what, what makes sense? And it, it may not make sense on, on a busy street. It makes a lot of sense. And I think you're agreeing with that when you say greater. It makes a lot of sense to, to be free-flowing traffic. And a lot of the streets on my ward, it, it doesn't until somebody finds that it's a problem. And when they do, then I have found that the DPW has listened and been receptive. And well, it's, it's not a criticism of the DPW. And also, there's a difference between a noise ordinance, which is very, very difficult to measure. measure. But it's very specific. But this could be very easily measured, and this could be very. It could be well, the noise ordinance is very easy because it's a decibel level. Well, do they, the, the police walk around with the devices. No, but if you know, but I mean, you could but say they should. But or they could. But with this, I mean, the, yeah, for me, for me, that's what that for me, that's why I'm asking what what has the department deemed an obstruction because this doesn't tell me. So that's part of what I'd like to know historically. So you'd like the policy to become more clearly defined? Um, possibly, but before we even before that, before that's even really, I mean, before 
I decide whether I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know um, what kind of how many how frequently the department, the board, or the department has deemed there to be obstructions and and um, and you know how they define it. I mean, I think we need that. Even left uh, alone, this is helps a fact. But Maybe we should continue this so Ned is here because yeah. he's the one with the, the history. Of We're continuing everything. Yeah. Also, just so you know, as, as far as the numbers game is concerned, I have not complained about any obstruction since I started working on this because I knew that this was the end result. Um, so I, at, at some point, I probably will make some complaints whether or not something is done. Yeah. I would say between 50 and 75, the 732 are actually in my way at some point when I go different places. Um, and I don't know that I would necessarily complain about all of them. Um, but one point that I, that I would like to make, and this is specifically regarding something you said when we spoke about it, which is that you don't notice them a lot. It's very difficult to notice most of them from the street. And even in my surveying, I noticed that when I would cross the street, I would start noticing obstructions that I hadn't noticed from the first side of the street if there were two sidewalks. And the reason for that, the primary, is because a lot of obstructions are in a reverse pyramid shape so that the entire sidewalk is clear at the ground level. But when you come up to arm height or chest height or head height, it just gets narrower and narrower. You should show if you're six foot two and see how many obstructions <laughs> there are. <laughs> right, and all you can't even start walk the city the streets. But again, I think what I'd like to also hear from certainly other counselors too, because we tend to hear about them. certainly with potholes. I mean, I had so many calls, but when something bothers people and they feel like they haven't gotten results on it, that's when the city counselor will, will get a call if it's bothering somebody. And I guess I just want to know: is this an issue that people are really? thinking about. And again, I, I agree that we probably should keep, if they're major walkways, I think that it's whether we hear or not, they should be cleared. But I'm not so sure. I certainly have not, but other counselors may hear differently. If you're the you know, counselor at large. And if we're hearing these things, I think it's an issue. But I don't want to create something where it doesn't exist. I, I, I don't hear some major outcry of this at all. Not at all. But, but, but I mean, it's, I think, in my opinion, if you can make your ordinance better and more clear, I think I think you, I think that's just, you know, sometimes that's that's well, always said. That's why I was asking about the intent here. I think that you two might have very different intentions, although you're working mm -hmm. together. I think you're looking for some legal, uh, what's the word, a way to address a, a, a gap in the law there. I think, and what I was trying to get at was my understanding from talking to you, not just at this meeting, Jasper, is that you're trying to encourage people to walk more and you're trying to make this a city friendly to walkers so that people are encouraged to walk more. That's one of two. Okay, so I want to hear what the second one is, but I do want to say that I, to me what's most important here, and I, I know that I'm repeating myself, but I, I really feel like I want to reiterate this, is that we have sidewalks that are passable to everyone, whether or not it's the maximal passability or not, that's not important to me. I want to make sure that people in wheelchairs can go down any sidewalk that they need to. I want to make sure that people can walk one or, t you know, one person or I would say at least two people at rest on a sidewalk. And that's, that to me is the way to measure this more than, you know, going for, everything has to be clear up until the, you know, where the pavement exactly ends or something like that. I think that that's, that's a much more reasonable way of going about this. But then you have to make the argument on that side for why Northampton taxpayers should pay for 60 inches of sidewalk on Con Street and only be allowed to use 30 and the property owner of that abuts it gets the other 30 to do what they want with. Do you have an argument for that? Um, I, I would go back actually to what Paul has been asking. I mean, how much are we, gen are we seeing that the, the 60 inches is being impeded? I mean, I, I think we would need to know something like that, but I would bet that it's fairly minimal. Well, there's 500, or I'm sorry, 350 approximately in here that are greater than 25%. I don't think any of them are on Con Street because the sidewalks there are new, and so obviously some of the stuff was done when that when was rebuilt.
Please so we're going to get back to this? We'll come back to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll come back because I, I would like to ask some other counselors what they've heard and what, and I think there are a number of questions. What they've heard, how have they, those complaints been dealt with? Have they been dealt with effectively? Um, and Councilor Adams, you're a, a lawyer here of rights language. Maybe you could come back with some, if you'd be willing to, some suggestions for us to talk about language. I would, I would, um, but first I'd like to hear you know, okay. how, how the DPW is dis, if, um, defined okay. it. And, um, I mean, I don't think you're going to find counselors who have had an outcry. I just have to guess. Because they're three years and none of us have. But for me, that's not a reason just to leave it alone either. I mean, if it can be improved, why not? Well, uh, I'll give you a I'll quick why not, which I think, I think we address laws when there's a need to create laws. I think that laws created start to be uh, overly burdensome. And I think we do it if there's a need for it. And if there's a need, I think we, if, if there's some way this is not functioning, we should rewrite it. But I'm afraid that we could have the same situation. Here's a law. You know, go cut down on South Street, you horse's ass. And, you know, because that's what it says. And I'm not so sure what we're addressing. Are we just looking to... to we're going to create a tree where it's going to be busy cutting down branches <laughs> all the time because they're getting in the way of the sidewalks. But let's see. I mean, we'll, we'll continue it to next time. Jasper, I hope you can come back. Oh, I I will. Um, if the meeting happens within six months of the scheduled date, yeah. Yeah. So um, that was I the last say. item on our agenda. Before we adjourn, can we talk about meeting in the summer and where we might meet? Part of this is I have some dates when I would not be here. When the regular meeting is scheduled, there have been times during the years I've been on this where we do not meet in the summer. Um, I would, I, because we have a number of continued items, we certainly have something on the agenda. Um, I'm going to throw out a date just to help us think you. It's not because we should mm -hmm. do this, but to start the conversation. And it's only because I am not here August 11. So here's what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting as we're meeting at the very end of June that we have our next meeting in August. And I'm suggesting that because I cannot come August 11. I'm suggesting it be August 4th which is only six weeks away, and I just want to see, would that work for people? And if not, let's talk about when. What's the name? Okay. So the next meeting would be August 4th. Yes. Are you interested in an update about the flooding at the end of State Street and, and Church Street? Do you all feel well? I, I've been well informed, but if well the other counselors would like to hear more about it. I, I, I feel that we got to okay. form. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bob. Entertain a motion to adjourn. So, Pulaski Park. Yeah, Pulaski Park. Oh, Pulaski Park. Sorry. Sure. No, briefly. Um, I had a two minute item on there just to let the uh, committee members know that the, the third of three um, design workshops with Stimson Associates will be this Thursday night from 6 to 8 p.m at the senior center. Um, the process is just going to be input in this one, or it's really just there now presenting the results of the first two? Um, there's sort of, there, we're continuing to get community input throughout, and we're, I think we're getting closer and closer to the final design. So everything up, up to this point has been sort of schematic level, getting input, trying to come up with a vision that people are going to be behind, and then we're hoping that by the time that this workshop is over Thursday, we'll be close enough with the concept of what the park elements are going to be that they can start working on construction plans. So that's that's ultimately where we are, but we're still seeking input on the state of the schematic as they'll bring it then. So. So just, I, I, I went to the first meeting and I've heard from a number of people at these meetings have been great. Yeah. That's the feedback. I heard that from a really lot of people too. I went to the first meeting, I thought it was great, but I heard the second meeting was even better. <laughs> <laughs> mm, you and I weren't at that. <laughs> Finally, we got a good group together. <laughs> I'll let you create a motion now to adjourn. Six. All right, Thanks. Thanks, Paul.